So, is attendance mandatory? No, not really, because you can watch the lecture. Is it strongly encouraged? Yeah, it's strongly encouraged because people get in the habit of not watching the lectures if they skip it. But, you know, the lectures are there so that if you miss a day or if you need a review, it's there. So I will record every lecture and they will get uploaded to our playlist. I'll post a link to our playlist inside Canvas so that everybody can find it, make it real easy for you to find. Okay, so we're gonna learn what variables are, decisions, loops, functions, classes, and yeah, you do know most of this stuff from Python, but then we're gonna go into some stuff that you probably did not do much of. We're gonna learn about structures and classes, object-oriented programming. We're going to use in here on these computers, Microsoft Visual Studio. If you have a Mac, you don't have to install Microsoft Visual Studio, though you can. They, uh, Microsoft, for the first time in almost 30 years, is now offering it on the Mac again. I did not know that until I had to look it up today. On the Mac, there's something called Xcode. Anybody using a Mac? Yeah, okay, so you're gonna to wanna to download and install Xcode. And that's something you do through the, the App Store. And then you're gonna to wanna to find a tutorial that shows you how to make C++ applications on it. And if you can't find a tutorial, ask me and I'll send you one because it's gonna look a little bit different. For today, and only for today, even if you brought your laptop, I'm gonna be showing you stuff on Visual Studio and it would be kind of awesome if you logged into this Google Computers in order to do that. Well, well I'll tell you, you know, in advance when we're gonna to need to do that. But that's just so that we can write like a 10 line program and get, you know, our fingers wet at the very beginning. Is it fingers? That sounds weird, our feet wet. Okay, so course information. You happen to know what time and what classroom it is because you're here. So I'm feeling good about that. My name's Jeff Thompson. I have an office downstairs in room 102. My office hours are posted there. I will also upload them to Canvas so that you know when I'm supposed to be here. But even if I'm supposed to be here, it's a good idea to text me, right? Just to make sure that something dumb's not going on. Like I was called to a division meeting and you show up and I'm not there, you'd be annoyed. So text me to make sure I'm gonna be at the time that you need to be there. If you need me to visit with you, but the office hours don't work out for you, we can set up an appointment. Like there aren't any classes on Friday, so I don't usually come in, but I'll be glad to come in on a Friday if that works for you. I have a phone number here. This is my personal phone number, not my office phone number, because I don't carry my office around with me, and I do carry my phone around with me. What I would appreciate is if everybody would grab their phone and send me a text message just right off the bat. If you'd be so kind, send me a text message to 405-898-7767. Just put your name, Tony Stark. Don't put Tony Stark, although I had one student do that in the last class, but that's because they knew that I already had their number. And then CIT 1203, right. Wait, this is not 1203. Don't put CIT 1203. That's if you did, <laughs> send me another message with the right number, 1173. So that really should be like your name. But I swear, when I put your name as the example, I've had people be, you know, scoundrels and put your name on that text message. <laughs> so whatever. Now you don't have to do that. But the reason I encourage you to do it is if you get stuck on a program, you don't even have to set up an office appointment. You don't even have to send me email asking for help. Just take a picture of your code, right? Send me a picture of your code and quite often within a couple of minutes, I can, you know, circle and annotate it and send it back to you, you know, telling you what you did wrong. And then you can get it fixed within five minutes, right? Rather than drive in or make an office appointment or wait and ask me about it after class, which is okay, right? But a lot faster and don't worry about Waking me up, I stay up until 2 a.m. every night, and I know how to mute my phone while I'm asleep, so you can send me messages at five in the morning or whatever. If you send me a message now, you have my name and number, and I'll make a list so that if for some reason I know class is gonna be canceled, right? Like I have the flu or something like that, I'll blast a message out to y'all saying don't bother to come in. If that's the case, I'll also post a notice on Canvas, right? So you'll get an email note as well. But it's awfully nice to get a note, you know, from your professor saying he's not gonna be there. He'd be unhappy if he showed up and I wasn't here. And if you know you're not gonna be here, you could send me a message saying, you know, hey, I'm not gonna be here. 
anything not you know anything I need to know and what I'll probably say is just watch the video right but it's kind of nice enough you don't have to do that all right delivery method lecture and online well really the only online components is that we use canvas and that's where I put our homework that's where I put our PowerPoints that's where you upload your homework that's where you'll find the quizzes and that's where you'll take the exams now since this class meets two times a week rather than just one time a week we'll go ahead and take our exams in the classroom rather than making y'all go to the library if it was just like a one time a week class or an eight week course or whatever and we couldn't afford to spend you know a day taking the exam but anyways we're going to take it in here exams scary word i'm leaping ahead but with exams don't sweat it they're open book open notes open popping up visual studio and typing stuff into it open bringing your laptops open raising your hand and asking the professor for help right so if you have test anxiety see if you can lower it because you know that you have your book you have your professor you can raise your hand and ask for hands so i'm not going to give you the answer but if it's a weird question i may come up here and give everybody the answer or at least give a good explanation of it because if you're wondering about it you're probably not the only one <laughs> So, we have a textbook starting out with C++ from control structures to objects. It's not like you have to have it today or tomorrow or the next day, so let me mute the recording. If you want to order it from Amazon, that's okay. You know, however you want to get it's fine. Know that if you rent the textbook rather than purchase it, if the bookstore is still offering that, but you don't give it back to them, they charge more for it than if you, uh, you know, if you bought it outright to begin with. Where do we find all this stuff? Where did I find the syllabus? I didn't let you see me get to it. You need to be able to log into Canvas. And if this is your first time, you know, it rose using Canvas, you may not know how to do it. I'm sure that there's a link to it on the main webpage, rose.edu, but I just type in canvas.rose.edu. We used to use D2L, so if you haven't been here, you know, since we use D2L, it, it looks a little bit different, but actually people like it more than D2L for the most part. Well, I did a search for it, I guess, because I typed in a comma. Canvas.rose.edu. Yeah, that works better. You'll get this dashboard. Now, if your uh, icons on it are looking kind of all, you know, colored and stuff like that, and you don't like it looking like that, you can change that. You can assign your own colors, for one thing. You can just click on the triple dots and pick a new color. But what I like to do is disable those colors. So where it says dashboard, and how do you log into Canvas? It didn't take me into it, but it ought to be your campus password, you know, your campus ID and your password. I believe that to be the case. By the way, were you able to get into it? Or Okay, it's weird that Canvas let you in when the yeah, computer didn't, but okay. So anyways, same password. I'm going to disable this color overlays. I like it better like that. And you're going to look for our class. Hopefully you see the C++ in your class listing. If you just enrolled like this morning, maybe it's not there yet. Don't stress, right? It'll be there soon. Nothing that happens today is going to count off from your score, although I do ask you all to upload something each day that you get here. And then you go into it, and what you're going to see, yeah, I have a whole bunch of stuff listed on the side. You're not going to see that much stuff listed on the side. It's going to look a little bit different for you. What you're going to see is something called modules. There'll also be something called assignments here, down underneath it. There's not, not any assignments there. All of our cool stuff will be posted under the modules, including our PowerPoints, including the explanation of the homework assignments, and including a link to our YouTube playlist. They're not there yet. The PowerPoint should be there. I'm not sure why they're not showing up. Maybe I just didn't click the publish button. On the other hand, you don't have to read chapter 10 yet, so maybe it's okay that they're not there yet. So once you get into Canvas and you click Modules and you see, well, the first thing you log in, you ought to see like the last three announcements. There's only one, so, you know, but it should show the last three sound, um, announcements, but if you want to see more, I'm sure there's a place where you could click on that to see more. Uh, oh, well, you know, you just click Announcements. How clever. Click Modules. The top link's going to be Class Information. What am I doing? I'm reading the syllabus. I don't like this little preview window, especially for PowerPoints. So whenever something pops up in the preview window, yeah, there's a maximize button, but I'd rather just download it and view it for the syllabus, you know, or whatever. But for PowerPoints, especially, you know, you have 70 pages or something like that, um, viewing it in the little preview window is annoying. 
So I just click on the name of the document and download it and view it in whatever application is supposed to handle it. Supposedly Canvas is pretty cool on the tablets and stuff like that too. I haven't tried it out. I bet there's even an app for it. <clears throat> So expected outcomes. We will learn the basic structure and parts of a C++ language computer program. So we're going to learn the syntax. We're going to learn how to write our own functions. We're going to learn how to write our own structures and classes. So it's going to be a little bit more complicated than Python, but everything you learned in Python will apply for. It's just that the syntax is different. That's OK. Once you learn two languages, it's like you can learn any language. right? because then you have the concepts down. Learning one language isn't enough to make it so that you could just sit down and, and, you know, in a week be an expert at the second language, but after you learn two of them, then you could probably be an expert in the third language really fast. So you're going to learn how to write, compile, debug, and execute various simple C++ programs. Well, when I say simple, I don't want them to be too simple, right? But what I mean is we're not going to write, like, you know, hundreds of pages of code for a homework assignment. Oh, and by the way, I know some people want to jump on downloading Visual Studio under the laptop. You don't have to do that, but if you look in the modules, there should be a link that says Azure First Time Login Instructions and another one that says Installing Visual Studio. And even you Mac users now can install Visual Studio. You don't have to use Xcode, meaning that you can use the same software on your machine at home that all the Windows users will be using. But if you want to learn Xcode instead, that's totally cool because if you're going to grow up to be an, you know, an iOS programmer, you know, to write, you know, iPhone apps, you probably want to use Xcode. So there's a link here that says Azure First Time Login Instructions. Just, oh, just ogle that. Follow the instructions. There's a link here. You're going to have to do whatever the doc, the uh, document says to create your account to be able to sign in. Once you do that, then the next document, installing Visual Studio, you just go to visualstudio.microsoft.com. You just have to go to DreamSpark and find it. Go to visualstudio.microsoft.com, and you're going to just want to pick a version. Now, when I reinstalled it today, to see, you know, to make sure that I knew what the students were going to see when they installed it. I chose community thinking it would be a lot smaller, but it still took like 20 minutes to download and, and 40 minutes to install. I don't know what was going on. Maybe in the internet was slow that day. Um, I just go ahead and grab professional, right? I don't think it takes that much more time to download, but you'll be able to get away with either one. Won't matter which. I don't know about choosing that enterprise one. Pardon me? I grab a professional. Enterprise, it says free trial for organizations. I haven't investigated how you do that. So grab community or professional. Okay. Unless you want to figure out how to establish yourself as an enterprise. If you feel like doing that and telling me, that'd be pretty neat, but I'm not sure of the differences. And Visual Studio Code. Don't get Visual Studio Code. That is pretty much just a text editor. Now, I could be wrong about that, but I've had people grab Visual Studio Code and then they eventually wound up grabbing the Visual Studio ID, which is too bad because it's a much smaller application. So if you feel brave and want to try to figure that out, that's cool. You're probably going to wind up going back to grabbing the, the regular one. You don't need to get both. The ID is the only one you need to get. Someday I need to get the Visual Studio Code to see if how to work it. It's a more recent thing. Visual Studio has been around since the 90s, you know, and they keep coming up with a new version of it each year. Uh, Thompson, do you know how, uh, the software, uh, how you learn to uh, check for faults and stuff like that, how to run the program and stuff like that? Well, you, know you learn how to do it in a class, and you can also find tutorials online. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what we're going to be doing in class, learning how to write the programs and check for, you know, errors and correct them and run through the debugger. Because in Python, it was a lot easier. When I tried that in the Visual Studio last summer, eh, I had problems with it. I could not figure it out. Yeah, well, in some ways it's easier, in some ways it's not. At least in Visual Studio, if you click on the error, it takes you right to the line, right? Where if you were using idle, you had to look at the error list and, and go and find it. So it'll become second nature pretty fast. Wait, and, uh, 
Are you talking about vegetable study that takes you right into the line? Yeah, yeah, we'll do that in a little bit. I'll get bored with the uh, the syllabus and then we'll go and launch the Visual Studio. Okay. It won't take long. And that means idle. Uh, we're not using that in this class, aren't we? No, we're not. And if the syllabus mentions NetBeans or idle, then uh, we're going to have to delete those. Yeah, that's wrong. Linux users may want to look and do something else, but not NetBeans. You might want to use, yeah, NetBeans will actually do it. But if there's a Visual Studio now for Linux, like I believe there is, you'd want to just use the same. If you're a Linux user, you probably know enough to find the, the uh, uh, a C++ development environment and install it, like Code Blocks or Eclipse or something like that. I say Mac users should use Xcode. I need to modify that. I did not know it today until today that Visual Studio worked great on the Mac as well. Previously, I had people running, you know, emulation software. They'd install, you know, Windows on their Mac if they did not want to use Xcode. So we will use Canvas, as already mentioned. You have an email account if you did not know that. You can just log into gmail.com and your email address ought to be something like your first name dash last name at raider.rose.edu and you should have all that information from when you enrolled and if not you can call the IT help desk whose number is at the end of the document I would just install you know I would just add that email address to my you know my phone or whatever my tablet so that I can you know send messages using a campus if you want to send me messages you can do it through canvas you don't have to remember my email address you can just do it directly through canvas Why do I have several copies of the syllabus? I only need one, really, guys. There we go. Oh, apparently I started making changes that one, though. Get lost. I'm confusing myself. So important dates, I just copied and pasted this from the course catalog, right? Our final is on December 12. Our midterm is going to be, you know, two months away from today. Um, I'll pick a date for the final and, and add it to the syllabus pretty, I mean, excuse me, for the midterm pretty quickly so that you'll know well in advance. But anyways, if you're going to drop the course, hopefully nobody will, you just got to do it by August 30 to get a full refund. The last day to withdraw from the course so that it doesn't show up on your transcript would be, you know, way into November. So, you know, you could make that decision way down the line. But I really don't want anybody to drop it. I want everybody to do awesome in it. My goal is to give out lots of good grades. I don't mind giving 70% of the class A's. It's not like I try to curve it to give more C's and A's or whatever. If people earn the grade, then, yo, I'll give you the score. I mean, I'll, I'll put the letter on your transcript. Great. Speaking of grades, the grading system is pretty boring. 90 is an A, 80 is a B, 70 is a C, so on. I'm not a jerk. Well, I mean, maybe I am, but if you're making like an 89.5, I'm going to probably round it up rather than round it down. So a third of the class is based on the programs you do. A third of the class is just basically showing up and uploading something at the end of the class. So pretty much just putting your bottom in the chair and typing stuff in during the class, you get you know a third of your grade. That's pretty nice. And then the quizzes and the exams make up the other third. The quizzes, you get to take as many times as you want. So if you only make a 70 on the quiz, take it again, make a 90, take it again, make a 100. Why do I do that? I do not use the quizzes as a metric for what you've learned. I use the quizzes as, you know, people sometimes want a sample exam. Well, I don't give out sample exams, but the quizzes, the quizzes are your sample exams. Some of the questions on the exam are drawn directly from the quiz. Like maybe I'll change, you know, a couple of words on it or something like that. But if you master the quizzes, you can be sure that you're going to come in, you know, totally pumped up on the exam. So you can take them as long as you, and many times as you like. So for submitting your homework, when you're home and you get your program running, what I would like for you to upload to the Dropbox, what you'll get credit for is if you take a screenshot of it and then you give me the CPP file, the C++ file. And it's not too difficult to do. The only trick is finding where that CPP file is hidden. It's not really hidden. And we'll write, and as a matter of fact, why don't we pause blathering about the syllabus and go ahead and write our first little program. 
So if you have logged into the PC sitting in front of you, go to the start box and type in Visual. You're kidding. We're using Visual Studio 2013 and y'all are downloading 2019 at home? All right. Mm -hmm. Well, whatever. It doesn't change that much from year to year. That's a little interesting. <clears throat> I'll ask about that. There's no reason for us to be using one that old. But it's not going to hinder our education. The C++ language does change over time, but it changes slowly. It gets ratified. You know, all the changes to it get ratified, you know, once every five or ten years. And I think the last time it was changed seriously was in 2011. So I think we're, we're golden using this version. But it's going to look a little bit different at home, but not too much. Or I guess you could try to define 2013 and install it if you want to use the exact same version. You probably could find that somewhere. But nah, get the newest, the latest and greatest. Okay, so when it comes up, it gives us this start page. That's pretty boring. It gives us this solution explorer. This thing is really important. If you don't see that, you're going to want to enable it. But the first thing we got to do is make our project, make our solution. They call it a project in one place and a solution in another. If we go new project, we get a whole bunch of different choices. Now when you install Visual Studio at home, the choices that you're offered here are going to differ based on what you chose to install. If you didn't choose Visual Basic, you're not going to have those options, which is good because we don't want Visual Basic. We want Visual C++. Specifically, we want an empty project. And it may sound weird that we want an empty project, but if we choose anything else, Microsoft sticks a whole bunch of framework code around it that we don't, don't need in order to learn how to write C++ code. You know, we want strict, pure, plain, and simple C++, so we're going to create an empty project. We're going to need to give it a good name. Well, why don't we call it Lecture A? And if it's like last semester, if I just click OK at that point, I'm going to get an error message. Maybe it's configured correctly now. But here's the path where it's going to be stored. Users, administrator, documents, Visual Studio. Well, that's on mine. Maybe you're, I mean, yours is going to say something different. But certainly creating it in an administrator directory is not going to work for me. So I'm going to click Browse and choose a different directory. You don't have to do that if that path looks good. But I'm just going to choose Documents. And I happen to have a folder here called Visual Studio 2013. And I think that'll be projects. I think that'll be good enough for me. Or I could even store it on my desktop, wherever you want. Or you can leave it in the default. You just need to remember where that is so that you can go and find your files later. Um, I'd like to add the source control thing. We're not going to want to do that yet. We can talk about what source control is, but we won't make it through the syllabus if I talk too much about it. What source control is, is you can write a program, and then if you ever need to modify it, if it's in source control, then you can make changes to it. And if you screw up your program, you can revert back to that last version. Or you can revert two versions back, or four versions back. You can see all the changes you made to it. But unless I learn how to use the one that's built into Visual Studio, I'm probably not going to lecture on it, but it's a well. You'll do. You'll use that. You'll learn it in a professional setting. So we actually should find a day to lecture about it. So lecture A. Remember your location, although it's not going to be too hard to figure out where it is. Click OK. What does it do? It creates a whole bunch of directories, but it doesn't create our source file. If you've taken Java, you may be used to it creating a source file as soon as you create the project. No, we're going to have to create our own source file. It's more like Python, right? You cranked up idle, and you, you, know, you had to actually do new file. Just because we have a project doesn't mean we have a file yet. Now, what if I couldn't remember where I'd created my, uh, my files, that directory? I can always, well, what if my solution explorer was gone? Which is very possible. You could load it up, and it would have a blank screen or something like that. You can always find the solution explorer under view. It's even the top window because it's that important, top choice. When we start adding files to it, they'll show up there. And as a matter of fact, that's where we're going to add our file. We're going to right click on source files and do add new item. 
And it says source.cpp, and that's an acceptable file name, but why don't we give it a better file name? Like if it was homework, we might want to call it homework one, but it's, it's a lecture, so let's call it lecture A. I use letters for the programs we write in class, and then the homework are given numbers. That makes it easy to differentiate. You're trying to remember when you did you know, a certain little bit of code. If we did it in class, it's going to have a letter at the end of the name. If you did it as part of homework, it'll have a number. All right, so I'm going to click CPP file because that's what it is. We'll talk about what a header file is when we need to. Click Add. And I'm not going to explain everything we're doing because this is just to get us a taste of what it looks like. All right, so I have a brand new file. I could double click on that. If you need to zoom the text in or out, I know that uh, y'all using your laptops with you know 8,000 by 6,000 resolution probably can't read it. You hold your control key and you spin the mouse wheel up or down. And there's probably other ways of doing that too, like control plus or something. I don't know how you do it from the keyboard shortcuts anymore. So we're, the first line of our program should be a comment. And I was just teaching Python a little while ago, so I typed a hashtag. That's not a comment in this language. That is a comment. Just put your name. Don't put my name. Put the date. First program, lecture A, something like that. This is a comment block. And I don't care if you type a comment block on your lectures when you're following along, but for your homework, I do. For your homework, you ought to have your name, maybe the date, what homework it is, and the short explanation of what it does. Calculates the interest rate, something like that, right? Or homework seven, or, you know, that'd be enough, but it ought to say a little bit more than that if you want to be professional about it. All right, in Python, it was as easy as doing print, right? And we do the print statement. It's not that easy in C++. It's not that hard, though, but we have to add something that says pound sign include less than the shift comma IO stream greater than. And by the way, if you get frustrated with typing along during class, you don't have to do it. You don't have to type, um, you know, you don't have to type along in class. But I do want you to upload something at the very end anyway, just to prove that you are here. And I think it's beneficial for most people to be typing along. That way you have notes from the class, right? Okay. So in Python, we could just lickety split, start adding input statements and print statements. In C, in C++ and in Java, everything has to be inside a function. So we're going to define a function. I know you C++ users, I mean you Python user did with the DEF keyword. We're not going to use DEF anymore. You can have a whole bunch of different kind of functions. The one that we want here is going to be void. I lied. Let's make it an int. Int space main, all lowercase, parentheses, in parentheses. And you know how in Python we use tabs to control where everything was? In Java and C++ and JavaScript, a whole bunch of other languages, Python's actually the aberration there. You use curly braces. So int main, parentheses, in parentheses, and then curly brace, in curly brace. It is a popular programming style to put the curly brace on the same line as the function name. I like seeing it below it. You'll eventually pick some you know, way that you want to do it that makes sense to you. Now, just because this language does not require tabs, it's still a good idea. It breaks your code up. All right, let's do C out. C O U T. Less than, less than. Quote. What, double quotes by the way, unlike Python, you can't use apostrophes there. What is your name? Question mark. Space, space. Or just a single space? I don't know. End quote. Less than, less than, ENDL. And as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm going to get rid of that space before the quote altogether. And I forgot something, which is why I'm getting that red underline under ENDL. 
It is supposed to be an L and not a 1, but the reason that's a syntax error is I forgot to add a line here. You're going to want to go above int main and add the line that I forgot. <coughs> it's three words. Using space, <coughs> namespace, that's all one word, namespace, and then the space bar, std, semicolon. One thing you'll notice about this language, unlike Python, is that a lot of the statements end in semicolons. Not every statement. You'll learn when to use them and when not to. Okay, that made the errors go away on C out and ENDL. Yes, sir. Sorry. Ah, no problem. All right, so we need to let them type something in. Now, don't type in what I was going to do. Remember when you did name is equal to input and it was that easy? It's not that easy in this language. You'll learn, though, all the little differences. The difference is that in this language, you have to declare your variable before you can use it. And I bet in fundamentals, the book talked about that, but you didn't have to do it. In this one, you do. And so our name needs to be held in a string. So we're going to type in the word string, all lowercase. If you know Java, then uh, you may be familiar with capitalizing one of those letters. Fortunately, we don't have to. And then we have to create a variable name. Why not name? Name is a perfectly good variable name. Semicolon. Now we need to let them type it in. And by the way, these less than, less thans, and greater than, greater thans are very, what's a fancy word for that, idiosyncratic. It's kind of specific to the C++ language. You're never going to see it in any other language. It doesn't mean it's bad. It just means it's kind of unique and looks different. C-I-N, greater than, greater than, the shift period. Notice the greater thans, the arrows are pointing the other way. That's because C out displays something to the screen. So the arrows are pointing to C out because this stuff's coming out of that variable into the screen. This is the opposite. CIN stands for input. So the input's going to go from the keyboard into the variable. So CIN greater than, greater than. I'm not getting an un underline there. Well, won't this be lame if... Uh, I made another mistake. See, I should have printed this out before I started free-forming it. Up here, where we have pound sign include, we need to add one more inclusion. Pound sign include, and it doesn't matter if it's above it or below it, pound sign include less than string greater than. One thing to notice about this language is that, although Java is even worse in this regard, you have to bring in a lot of pieces of it in order to get the same stuff to happen that you could do in Python. In Python, you did not have to add an import just to read from a file or to read from the keyboard or to print on the screen. Here, we're having to do every piece we do, it seems like, needs a new library brought in. Eventually, we're going to copy and paste this entire thing or part of it so that we can just copy and paste it into our code each time. And I call that boilerplate. I'm not going to do that yet, but on Thursday we probably will. OK, so CIN greater than greater than name. If you did this line here, fix the error in that line. And now let's print out something. We'll, we'll greet them. Pardon me? Good question. Which part is yellow? I see this. Yeah, I got yellow. Oh, yeah, that's right. Except the top part. Oh, you're right. Yeah, it's yellow alert. Means Klingons are coming. Um, do y'all have these little minus signs here? Yeah. yeah. What? Show me what it looks like. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's the same version. <laughs> Good question. Don't know. 
I don't know why it looks different. Fortunately, that's not a huge difference, but no, nope, I can't explain the difference. I'm stymied. OK, so C out, less than, less than, because our data is going to the screen. So we've got to use less than, less than, rather than, greater than, greater than. Quote, hello, comma, space, end quote, double quote, less than, less than, space, name, less than, less than, double quote, exclamation mark, or period if you're not feeling so excited, end quote, less than, less than, E-N-D-L. All right, our program is finished, but it's, we're not going to like the results. I'll show you what I mean. When I run it, when I press the green arrow to run it, and it asks me sure to build it, I'm going to click Do Not Show This Dialog again. I want it to build it every single time. All right. It starts the build. It does some stuff. It does some other stuff. It does some other stuff. It runs. I get to type in my name. I hit Enter, and boom, it closes the window. Now, that's annoying. And it doesn't do that if you're using Xcode on the Mac or some things on Linux. But it does on Visual Studio, but we can fix that. So on Windows, and only on Windows, don't do this unless you find out you have to. It'll, be a, it'll produce an error on those other systems. Kind of a Microsoft-specific trick. We're going to do system, parentheses, quote, pause, P-A-U-S-E, end quote, in parentheses, semicolon. What does that do? It just keeps the screen open, right, so that we can see the results. It's green now. Yeah. It's because we ran that. Oh, is that the trick? Okay, once you, green, once you run it, then it divvies it up by color. Right. That's interesting. Okay, so what is your name? Jeff. Hello, Jeff. Press any key to continue. Now, that's actually as far as we're going to take the program. What if I had a syntax error? Well, you already know what it looks like if you have a syntax error because some of y'all got them, but... Like, what if I had left out a semicolon somewhere? Well, it may tell me with a little red line over here. It may not. When I try to run it, it's going to make an error list. Now, when it says, would you like to continue and run the last successful build? Heck no. Why would you want to run it if it has errors? Not only am I going to say no, I'm going to say, do not show this dialog again. All right, it produces an error list. If you don't see the error list, you can find it under View. And then you can just, just click on the first error and fix it. Double click it. It'll give you some explanation. Hopefully it's written in enough good English that you can figure it out, but it may be kind of technical, right? But anyways, it's telling me missing a semicolon before C out. That doesn't mean I need to add a semicolon there. I could. Instead, I need to put it there. Once I do that, it fixes all the errors, but it doesn't show it as having fixed it. It doesn't know that this next one is fixed, so I do it again. And now it's ready to go. Basically, only fix one error at a time. It may show 70 errors, right? 70 errors caused by one problem. I'm not sure that I can give an example of that, but we'll see that at some certain point. Just double click on the error list, find the first one. Now this one's kind of cryptic. I'm gonna fix it, not even bother explaining it. But that's kind of nice that you get an error list that you can double click on and it'll take you directly to the line. All right, that's just about enough programming. Yeah, we'd like to take it farther, but we gotta get back to the syllabus and stuff like that. When you upload homework, I want you to take a screenshot. Not for classes, not for, you know, the lectures. It's kind of a waste of time for lectures. But for homework, I want you to take a screenshot. Fortunately, it's, it's easy. If you're doing it on Windows, you'll learn how to do it. Just a second. 
you'll have to look it up or maybe my help document helps you. What you do to take a screenshot is you press the print screen button, which is next to F12. Find it on your own laptop if it's somewhere different. Print screen, F12. Notice it says SysRec underneath that. Nobody knows what that does. I don't know what that does. All right, and then I need to paste it. I can paste it into a Word document or a Paint document. Well, everybody has Paint. So I'm going to come down here to where it says Type here to search. And I'm going to click Paint, type in Paint, and run it. It's used to recover from freezes. Really? Like if your computer's frozen and it's not working very good. You're kidding. You can type in low level like codes. Oh, cool. I will have to try that. All right. I'm kind of ashamed that if I've been programming for 30 years and don't know how to do that. But anyways, all right. And now I'm just going to press Control V, like vehicle, not Control P. That's for printing. But you can also print, I mean, paste by coming over to this clipboard thing, right? But anyways, Control V, and then you'll save that somewhere. Desktop or save it to a homework folder or something. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you can also use uh, the... Uh, Snipping. You're right. There's a snip tool and there's something else on the Mac, however you like taking screenshots. I just demonstrated one way. There's like four or five different ways on Windows to do it. And on other operating systems, there's different ways. So you're right, the snipping tool. It's pretty cool. It's a good way to do it. I think, I could be wrong, but when we hit print screen, maybe if we precede it with a... Uh, a function key I don't remember on Windows T on on Windows 10 it drops a copy of that file in a folder I'm not sure about that it would be worth looking up for one thing you want to make sure that if you're taking screenshots and you didn't want those files hanging out where they are I'll look that up but anyways okay I have a file I'm gonna save it file save as I'm gonna make something off my desktop to store stuff into so I'm just going to go to desktop, new folder, and I'm going to call mine CIT 12, um, 1173. I'm stuck on 1203. And put, well, today's lecture was lecture A. So I'm going to call my file lecture A.png. And yeah, if you're using a different tool for taking screenshots, you're going to do different things, but you know how to do it. OK, so I have a screenshot that I can upload. Yes, sir. Just a sec. I'll be right back there. Mm -hmm. By the way, if you want to crop your screenshots or whatever, fine. If you don't want to, that's totally fine. You don't have to take 20 screenshots showing all the output of the program. Just take one screenshot to show that it worked. And normally I'm going to want you to upload the source code as well, but today we're going to save time and not do that. Anyways, file, save as, PNG, I already did that. Go into whatever folder and save it. Now say that this was a homework assignment. Well, we're going to go ahead and make a Dropbox for you to submit it into. Because this may be your first time looking at Canvas. You need to see what it looks like. <laughs> class does get tiring. Sometimes the entire class is like zombified this late. Y'all are actually talking to me. I appreciate that. You must have coffee or something. Thank you. Well, there's a whole bunch of things that I didn't want you to see. What are all those? If you see some exams and quizzes and stuff like that listed, ignore those for now. I will reopen them if they're not, but, well, not the exam.
All right. So when you're ready to upload homework or a daily lecture, let me make sure that the folder shows up for y'all. I won't have to do this every time. What you're going to want to do, go ahead and refresh your page. You will see assignments. Now I'm going to go into student emulated mode so it looks just for me like it does for you. Student view, assignments, lecture A. That's weird about those quizzes. All right, click submit assignment. See, it's different from D2L where you had to add the file first. Here we click Submit Assignment, and you choose a file. Normally, I'm going to want you to give me both the CPP file and the screenshot. Today, let's just do the screenshot, and then we get back to the syllabus. Maybe we'll get out early. We'll find out. And then go to wherever you saved your screenshot. And by the way, on your laptop, if you're not seeing file extensions, this is just a note for you later on when you are working on your screenshot. If it says lecture A without showing PNG, you really want to be able to see screen, uh, excuse me, extensions. So if that is the case, you're going to want to find out how to enable file extensions. In Windows 10, it's pretty easy. You can just Google it if you need to. The way you do it is you go into File Explorer. You click View, and I'm going through it quickly because you can Google it. Options, Change Folder and Search Options, View. And if you bring your laptop in, right, and you still need help doing it, that's totally cool. What's dumb is that Microsoft by default has hide ex extensions for known file types. Clicked. Meaning that you don't see the difference between a .doc .doc file and you know an Excel file versus a CPP file or whatever. You're going to want to make sure that hide extensions for known file types is deselected. And the reason for that is you're going to wind up uploading the wrong file to me and I'm going to have to you know, give you partial credit for it and you're going to have to go and find the right file. And I'll save time on both of our parts if you can see the extensions. This time it's easy, right? There's no extension. I mean, we already know where our file is. And then click Submit Assignment. You ought to get a nice little message saying that it was submitted. Oh, I guess it's not as uh, emphatic as it was. Okay, submitted. That's pretty subtle compared to D2L, but that's all right. When I grade it, there will be a comment there. Now, if it, if for a lecture, I'm not going to go in and give comments, right? You, you'll get full credit for it, but I'm not going to give you comments on lectures. But for homework, I will. You know, either good job or you know, you forgot the screenshot or program doesn't work, something like that. Now let's get back to the syllabus. There's more important information yet to cover. All right, grading policy. The program has to work for you to get credit. What do I mean by that? Well, that syntax error when I deleted a semicolon and then I try to run it. Well, bummer, it didn't run. Yeah, you can even take a screenshot of that and upload it. And yeah, once the deadline comes, you may as well do that right? But you're not going to get credit for it until it works. So what will happen is go ahead and upload it before the deadline, even if it's not working. Put a comment in saying that it's not working. Don't make it a surprise to me, right? Put in a comment saying what's wrong if you know that there's something wrong, right? Program doesn't compile or doesn't create the output or whatever, right? I mean, I'll figure it out anyways. But if that's the case, you're not going to get full credit for it. If it has a syntax error, you're going to only get one point, you know, one out of ten or whatever. Um, if it runs but it produces the wrong output, like it's supposed to calculate, you know, compound interest, but it always says you owe a negative amount of money, whatever, then uh, you'll get partial credit for it. Well, bummer, I failed the assignment. I only got 50%. No, you get to revise it. Revise it and resubmit it. Because in the real world, if I hired you to write a program, You'd give it to me, and then I might find problems with it, right? And then you'd fix it, and you'd give it to me again. And you'd fix it, and you'd give it to me again, just like, you know, game publishers on Steam, right? You know, they, they're constantly giving you updates. Once you get, just say, once you get your program running, you're going to make an A on it. 
but in the interim time, you know, it'll be a 50% or 70% or something like that. But I'll put a comment and say why he didn't get full credit. And it'll say, please resubmit for full credit. And it doesn't matter that the deadline is passed at that point, right? Because you can't go back in time and fix it, right? Because I might not grade it for a week. But if there's something wrong, if I say there's something wrong, you didn't get full credit for it, then just revise it, resubmit it, and you'll get more credit for it. Probably an A. Yes, sir? When we're turning in uh, the Visual Studio document, yeah. we'll be doing like ups. You want to see me exactly. Okay. I didn't talk people through that this time, but that's what you're going to upload. Okay. Or you can zip the entire project. Either way works. Okay. We'll talk more about that on Thursday. So does that make sense? You don't get a perfect grade on it or you don't make an A on it. Just revise it, re-upload it. Kind of like the quizzes. All right. If you only receive partial credit, revise it and resubmit it. Unless, I will always tell you that you can do that. The only time you wouldn't be able to do that is if you failed it because you cheated. Academic dishonesty. <laughs> I'm not going to give you a zero for it and then say, oh, and by the way, you can resubmit it. Nah, academic dishonesty is a big topic. We'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> you always have at least a week, usually a week. If I give you a homework assignment tonight, which I'm going to do, which is just to install Visual Studio or whatever and take a screenshot and upload it, don't even have to write a program, it's due a week. It'll be due Monday at midnight, right? I'm never going to come in or on Tuesday and say, oh, you need to do this by Thursday. That'd be real lame, right? That only basically give you one day to do it. So, nah. Always get a week to do your work, and if it falls on a break, right, you'll probably get even more time. One note is you have to do at least half the programming assignments to pass the course. Even if you have a, a perfect 100 on the exams, if you haven't written any of the programs, you're not going to pass. It's because you have to be able to apply your knowledge, not just take tests, right? Because if you go and get a programming job, you actually have to be able to program and not just take tests. Just about no professor on campus is supposed to be giving out incompletes anymore. What is an incomplete? An incomplete is like if you got two thirds of the way through the class and then you know things went south and you know and you had to quit going to school or whatever. What we're supposed to do now is instead of giving you an incomplete, is we're supposed to give you the grade that you'd earned up to that point, like you did 70% of the coursework, you get a C, or you know you didn't get to do enough, you made an F. Well, just talk to me about it. And then I'll give you some weeks at the end of, after the semester is done to catch up and finish it. And you can raise your grade. I'll be happy to file a grade change request. What always happened is that uh, if we filed an incomplete, we had to go back in. We were supposed to go in and change them to an F if you didn't do the work anyways. And everybody thought that, OK, well, I am gonna, I'm just going to accept that incomplete. It's no big deal. Well, it is a big deal because I was going to change to an F anyways. So why not just cut out the middleman? So, if you get towards the end of the semester and you're going to have to drop, think about talking to me and seeing if you can keep working past the end of the semester. But if you do that, there'll be a period of time when your grade's not as high as what you want. You better talk to me about that before the end of the semester, though. Don't look at your, uh, your report card, your transcript two weeks later, and then go, well, I wish I'd done one more program. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about it beforehand. So late assignment policy, I'm kind of kind on late assignments. I always give you at least one day's grace, you know, and I might not even count off if it's, you know, like up to a week. After that, you're certainly going to get deductions on it. In-class lectures are a little bit different, you know, how we upload something at the end of the lecture. But if you miss, you know, the lecture, you probably won't watch the video until the weekend, right? And I'm not going to count off late. But if something's not turned in within four weeks of its due date, you don't get any credit for it, whether it's a, a lecture or homework. And the reason for that is it just builds on stuff. Program two, you need to know everything that you learned for program one. Program three, you need to know everything you learned for program two. Your professor needs to learn to proofread. There we go. So you got to stay caught up or else things go downhill, right? And yeah, I will work with you if you tell me, yeah, i got to go to Wisconsin, you know, and help my mother do blah, 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 and so I'm going to be turning this stuff in late. Yeah, but you're going to want to try to catch up as soon as possible. Don't blow it off and wait until the end of the semester and hope that you can turn in seven homework assignments. No, everything needs to be done within a month of it being assigned, and that's pretty generous, actually. So attendance, I do take attendance. Doesn't mean you're going to get any points off. Once you click on grades, 
after attendance is starting to be taken, you're going to see an attendance percentage, like 100 or 75 or whatever, but that doesn't count for your grade. Don't sweat it. If you don't show up, just watch the video and upload something, right? That's all you got to do. It's a good idea to show up every day if you possibly can, but if you miss it, just watch the video. Speaking of attendance, why don't we handle that right now? AW policy. You may already know this, but if you don't show up in the first two weeks of a class or the first one week of an eight week semester, then you get dropped from the class and an AW is recorded on your transcript. You can't get any money back for it. And if anybody gave you a grant to come to school, they come and take it out of you. So you always want to attend. Usually it's not a problem, but I actually have had somebody wait three weeks into a course and then contact me saying, why was I dropped from the course? I say, did you ever show up? No? Did you ever do any of the homework? No? But I didn't know attendance was mandatory. Well, did you read the syllabus? No? So anyways, right. That's not going to get any of y'all because you're here. Student expectations. You need to have access to the internet. Thankfully, that's not hard for most people. And C++ development tools. If it's flat out impossible for you to install any version of C++ on your computer, you can use the campus computers. Or you can use what's known as the online C++ compiler. So if you're sitting there bored, when you know when you're at Wendy's and you want to write a program, you can go to Google and type online C++ compiler. The only problem with this is that it doesn't save it, right? You'd have to copy and paste the text into a file or something like that. So you really want it in, uh, you know, Visual Studio or the like. Please attend class or watch the videos. Use the required text. You paid money for it, so go ahead and use it. Keep up with the schedule. Complete your assignments on time. If you're doing all that and you're taking the quizzes, and then if you even do a halfway good job on the exams, you're probably going to make at least a B in the class. Please communicate with the professor about problems. If I'm not being clear, let me know. Don't wait until you're filling out a review, right, you know, to ding me at the end of the semester. Um, let me know in advance, right? Ask for your help when needed. Text me. Please feel free to bring your laptop. Go ahead and silence your phones. You know, I'm not going to yell at you if you're checking your phone. I know that people are glued to your, their, their phones. Um, but if you have it on vibrate, don't put it on your desk where it buzzes every two minutes because that really annoys the people next to you. That sounds stupid for me to mention it, but I've actually had people complain. Could you tell Joe to? <laughs> so anyway, don't do that. Don't put anything on your screen that's more interesting than I am. So, you know, only put the academic stuff on the screen. Don't watch Twitch videos on your laptop, I mean, on your phone. Uh, you, you can afford to not watch that Super Mario tournament, you know, until you get home. I'm sounding sarcastic, but I've actually had people do that. Another thing that just blew my mind was when two people sat at the back of the class with their portable PlayStations, that kind of dates it. You know, their PSPs playing Street Fighter or something like that against each other. It blew my mind that you'd come, you know, and you'd pay all the money to come to class and then you'd do that. Anyways, expectations. I gave you some expectations. You better give me some too. If I don't give you clear instructions for the assignments, let me know. I've messed up. I will probably revise the assignments and publish them for everybody. I will certainly at least explain it to you. If I mess up and don't put a due date on an assignment, I will date it a week. Right, I'll give you a week on it, even you know if it was supposed to be due tomorrow, because it's not fair if you thought you had extra time on it because it didn't have a date. Right, I better be answering your questions, whether you pose them in email or text or whatever. I better be grading your assignments and giving feedback for work that needs correcting. I better give you a week's notice of due assignments. I always will. Two weeks notice of exams. Well, yeah, we'll know well in advance because we know the date of the final, and I'll give you the date of the midterm pretty soon. And then I'll post all the announcements and everything, all your notes to Canvas. Consequences of academic dishonesty. If you're cheating, didn't I just give the lecture about cheating or did I not? Mm -hmm. Maybe that was last class. I've given the same lecture four times in a row. How can you cheat in a programming class? Okay. Like the second most common way is if you do this. What if I give you a homework to calculate pi? Say, so, uh, oh, I don't know how to calculate pi. I don't understand the professor's instructions. Calculate pi to n digits C++. Hmm. All right. Look. Copy, paste, submit. 
nah, you're not going to get credit for doing that. I'm going to be able to spot that you did it. It's just not going to look like something that we did in class. Okay, You're going to get a zero on that. Now, that's not the only way. What's another way? You can cooperate. You can both write the same program. This is most common when you have roommates, right? You have two people using the same computer. It's real it's easy to want to write the program once and upload two copies. The other thing that happens is I can't figure out my program. I'm going up to you. And I go, can I look at your code? Can I, I just can't figure it out. Oh, could you email it to me? I'll look at it later. And it turns out I haven't written a line, and I take your code, and I submit it as over mine, and then you get a little notice on the screen that's saying academic dishonesty, you got a zero on it, and you're real angry at me. <laughs> if somebody asks to look at your code, never mail them your code. That's, that's bitten people before. And usually one of them will admit to copying from the other, and so I don't have to fail. <laughs> don't have to fail Serena. But anyways, so... You can't sit there, both people working on the same program, and you can't give your code to anybody else. Now, if y'all are in class together working on lectures, and you can't find the syntax error, and you've already fixed yours, and you notice that the semicolon's missing, it's totally okay to point at the other person's screen. You know, y'all can buddy up like that, but don't let that establish a relationship where you think, okay, now I have a programming partner, and we can just trade our stuff back and forth. What's the other way you can cheat? Believe it or not, I've had people pop open email programs or you know online chat programs and try to send test answers to each other. Don't do that. Another way that people have cheated is to pop open Google and search for answers. Now in this class, I let you use your notes and stuff like that. So go ahead and use your notes. That's totally cool. I don't want to patrol people's screens on my computer. This isn't orange is the new black. I'm not a prison guard. So, you know. I'm going to trust y'all to some extent. I might sit at the back, but I'm not going to be patrolling. Just you, 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 just do your own work, take your own exams, and it's all going to be cool, right? The only reason I have to be emphatic about it is it really does happen, even though it sounds stupid, right? It sounds stupid. You're cheating yourself if you try to get away with it. If you do that, what happens is... You get an F, a zero on the assignment. You don't get a chance to redo it. Also, you get reported to the division dean. I write up the paperwork. Not because I'm a jerk, it's just that I'm required. I mean, I am a jerk, but you know, I have to do this. And the director of student conduct as well, the office of, and so the reason for that is it used to be that if somebody was caught cheating, then uh, they'd go to their, their teacher and they'd say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I just hadn't had any sleep. I didn't know what to do. I just couldn't figure it out. This is the only time. Can, can you let it slide? And the teacher would let it slide. And then it turned out that that person had a, you know, a history of doing it over and over and over. And so now that doesn't happen anymore because it goes to the director of student conduct first thing. And you can even be expelled from campus or dropped from the class. So you don't want to do it. All right, there's something called the Student Success Center where you can get study skills workshops and learning style assessments and things like that. You can click on that link to learn about it. Bookstore, well, there's a Rose Bookstore link. I always just go to Google and type up Rose Bookstore, but also inside Canvas. What, did I close Canvas? No. There's this thing over here that says Full It Discover. Now, I honestly don't know if you can order your book right then and there, or if you have to go to the bookstore and do it. But you can log in to Follett Discover with your account, and you can see the books that are required, right? This is not a C-Engage text, so you're not doing anything with C-Engage or MindTap, which may please some of y'all who did not like MindTap. You don't like MindTap, Mr. Thompson? Some people don't. I'm, I'm fine with it, but on, on the other hand, I'm not the one having to read it and take the exams on it. I've heard complaints. So. I had dealt with my tap before, and it was terrible. See? If I ask, at the end of the semester, sometimes I ask people to say, if you did not like using MindTap, raise your hand, a whole bunch of hands go up. And then if I ask, did you like using MindTap? No hands go up. But anyways, there are some advantages to it, but people find it frustrating. All right, there's a student handbook 
you don't have to go and look for it because I give you a link to it. It got all sorts of information, like to the tune of 100 pages worth. It's worth looking at the table of contents and seeing if there's anything you want to look at. Career services for students, placement testing, you know, all the good stuff and the bad stuff. Academic grade appeals, right? I don't give you a good grade. You want to complain about it? Hey, uh, there's a process for it. Why don't you talk to me first about it, though, right? Uh, I've never actually had anybody file an academic. Well, you, you may wind up doing it. Read the textbook. I mean, read the text. Okay, and then lastly, the supplemental syllabus. And this is incredibly important stuff. I really wanted to get us out early, I, but I can't skip covering this. This is stuff that used to be in every syllabus, and so they took it out, and they put it in its own separate document. And so if you've taken a lot of classes and set through a lot of syllabus lectures, you've already seen this, the mission statement. We're here to provide higher education programs, academic integrity, well, I've already talked about that a lot, but there's 10 paragraphs on academic integrity. The American with Disabilities Act, Rehabilitation Act, if you need anything that will put you on par to doing as well as you want to do, right? You know, some people have dyslexia. Some people, you know, need a lot more time to accomplish things than others. I've had somebody, you know, who could only type with one arm, uh, you know, and they couldn't type as fast in class, and so I told them, well, you don't have to do the notes, you know. You don't have to type this stuff in in class, or, you know. I've actually sat down with a student, you know, who was taking the exam and sat there to be available to, you know, tell them to help read the questions for them, and it was okay, right? But you got to have the worksheet filled out, right? So you go talk to Janet Griffith at Student Access Services, and then she helps you fill out a sheet, and she gives it to me, and I try really hard to accommodate your needs. Absolutely no shame there. It's way more awesome for you to go and get the help you need than to suffer. Mental health, if there's anything that's distracting you, and that's a, a light term, right? There could be serious things going on in your life, really serious stuff that you may be having trouble with handling, they may negatively impact your academic performance. And you don't feel like talking to me about it, you know, I'm not a, a mental health counselor, go and talk to these folks. They're it's free, which is pretty awesome, and what's even more awesome is that they're actually good at it, right? These are good people. Like, for example, one person uh, came to me to tell them that they had been physically abused by a professor at another institution. I said, whoa. I called the, you know, I, I sent them to talk to these people, and these people, you know, worked it up the chain of a command over to the other school, and that person was appropriately dealt with who had done the physical abuse. So these are good people. If you don't attend, you get an AW. Electronic communication, we've talked about that. You have an email account. Title IX. Sexual misconduct, it cannot be absolutely guaranteed that every piece of information you share, like if some, you know, if some instructor is, you know, um, sexually harassing you, somebody's going to need to be told about it in administration, right? And if you told me, right, that somebody physically attacked you, then I would need to let them know, right? So, you would just need to know that, but on the other hand, the information disclosed will be kept as private as possible, only relayed to the necessary officials on the campus. We have a library called the Learning Resource Center. If you need to miss the midterm, you can take the midterm at the testing center at the library, or even the final. But why not show up? Because I'm not there to help you there. And the Center for Success, Inclusion, and Diversity. Right, so LGBT, DACA students, other underrepresented populations, they can help you out. The Single Mothers Academic Resource Team. Black Male Completion Program, there's all sorts of resources available to you. And then there's the Career Center, Job Search Skills and Strategies. And then lastly, another link to the Student Handbook. I'm going to blip back over to my syllabus because the last page is Help. Now, if you can't log into Canvas, it's hard for you to get a hold of this page, right? But just go ahead and take the time to enter the IT Help Desk into your phone. So if you need it, you have it, right? Grab your phone and create a, a contact for the IT help desk because if you can't log in, you're going to want to call them. 733-7356.
if you can't log in to canvas it's useful to have this website available to you as well so you might bookmark that or at least google up you know rose.edu canvas support and what you do is you fill out a little form you give them your phone number and they call you and they tell you how to fix the problem or they tell you to tell your teacher that he's lame and made a mistake Alrighty, are there any questions? The only homework assignment, and I'll upload a folder for it after class is done, is to install Visual Studio and take a screenshot, or if you're not going to do that, or the equivalent on the Mac, then upload a note saying how you're going to do your homework, right? Just so that I'm prepared and I know, you know, the, the uh, challenges you're going to face. Any other questions? Yeah, I mean, we can hang out, you know. I don't mind hanging out like until 1030 or whatever, and so. Any other questions? Yes, sir.
you know, I guess you and I are going to be co-workers then? Or <laughs> do you do you uh, two number three on now? Um, no, I, I, you are going to be semi though, right? Or no, I'm yeah. I'm in trio. Oh, trio. Yes. I'm oh. in trio office. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to keep clear with you. Sure. Probably, probably won't show up again.